everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, today we have two prominent uh, human rights activists, two lawyers, uh, from uh, one from Pakistan and one from Turkey, but they're also very international profiles. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Nikat, Nikat Dad uh, from Pakistan. Uh, she's born in Lahore and uh, she's a lawyer by profession. And she, she has set up uh, the Digital Rights Foundation in 2012. Uh, and she's the executive director of Digital Rights Foundation. And uh, this uh, foundation uh, is specifically active for pro women to protect themselves from online harassment, uh, but not just that. And uh, she, she's uh, really one of the most prominent activists in this field, uh, both regarding the gender rights aspect of it and also the digital uh, rights part. In 2015, she was named at, uh, as the Times Magazine's, uh, uh, she was in the uh, Times Magazine's list of next generation leaders. And uh, she, ha she has also many awards, like Kerem Altıparmak. Uh, they are decorated really with many awards. Uh, in uh, Nikat's case, uh, Atlantic's, uh, Atlantic Council's Digital Freedom Award is one of them. And uh, in 2020, in one of the, her uh, re recent uh, successes, so to say, uh, Facebook appointed her uh, as uh, content oversight board. I think it's more a success for Facebook uh, because we, we need such uh, high profile uh, activists uh, and human rights sensitive activists like Nikat uh, to be active in social platforms like this, uh, big uh, companies, so that they also uh, respect the uh, social sensitivities in general. And also uh, we have Kerem Altıparmak. Uh, he's very well known in Turkey, uh, of course, and uh, he's also has international aspects in, uh, in his career, just like Nikad. And uh, I, I, I'd like to say that he's still a part of the Ankara University Faculty of Law. I don't consider him uh, as one of the uh, purged academics. We, I always want to see the academics uh, who, ha who are uh, forced out uh, of their jobs is still a part of the uh, foundations, uh, the organizations that they, they are part of, they were a part of, and I'm sure he'll be uh, back in Ankara University uh, and he will be active in academia for many years to come because these times are, uh, are going to be passing one way or the other uh, thanks to their activism. Uh, uh, Kerem uh, was uh, the director of the Human Rights Center of Ankara University uh, until its closure at the end of 2017. And he's uh, active in many human rights projects uh, uh, outside the university, both uh, when he was in the university and after uh, when uh, he had to leave the university. Uh, for a while, let's say, and uh, it's thanks to his and uh, Yaman Akdeniz's uh, application that uh, the ban of YouTube and Twitter, the Twitter block in uh, Turkey uh, was overcome because he, he has applied uh, to the Euro European Court of Human Rights and eventually the Constitutional Court has to decide uh, that uh, YouTube and Twitter block had, has to be uh, lifted. Uh, so, uh, I'm very glad uh, to be uh, the moderator of this panel uh, and I'd like to turn to uh, our panelists and uh, ask them first, uh, what prompted uh, them to activism? Uh, how did their uh, activism story start? So first, Niktat, let's turn to you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really honored to share panel with my esteemed panelist and uh, you as a moderator. Um, so I, I, so with me, my activism, my, so I believe that my personal is political. And uh, when I started uh, working on digital rights, uh, I think there was a whole set of um, patriarchal pushes a theme behind you know this activism because uh, i mean i i hope that the t turkey uh, t the people in turkey know that when countries like pakistan we although we are a muslim country but you know our cultures are still very different and um women uh, in
my country they are they make half of the population we are more than 200 million people in pakistan and half of them are women when i and by training i'm a lawyer when i started practicing law uh back in 2007 i found a misogyny and sexism uh, and harassment was so rampant in even in my legal fraternity uh, and uh, I had to do some personal cases uh, uh, with regard to, for instance, the custody of my son. And I, as a lawyer, faced so much discrimination. That's prompted me that even if I'm a lawyer and I'm a, an empowered woman, I know what my legal rights are. Just imagine the woman who know about the rights, but they just cannot do anything because of the uh, male dominance in the society or you know the patriarchy where usually uh, especially the middle class or the lower middle class families um, women are mostly dependent on men uh, either they are fathers or brothers or husbands or sons and uh, most of the time the decisions about their lives or about other things they just cannot take those decisions because of lack of agency uh, over their own bodies. So I think that's something that I, uh, that pushed me to do something more, not just my own legal practice, but you know, largely for the society and digital rights. I found a new area, uh, where, uh, I mean, even in my case, I had, uh, 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 my family, especially the male members of my family didn't allow me to access a mobile phone. Um, uh, and, to own one and uh, and I was always uh, I always wondered that why is it my brother who have who absolutely had no problem to a phone or access an internet but why is it always me and I think that that sort of pushed me to work on uh, digital rights from the perspective of women and gender and marginalized communities in Pakistan. And Karim, uh, how was your case? Uh, why digital rights? Why activism? Uh, I think my story started uh, at a relative good days in Turkey. Uh, when I did finish my PhD in 2002, uh, there were a lot of projects going on at the universities and most of those projects were conducted with state authorities because uh, the EU was funding uh, Turkish universities to work with the state authorities to train uh, public officials uh, in the human rights field. Uh, but uh, I was thinking even at that time that human rights should be worked with civil society rather than uh, the state authorities. And um, I, I tried to convene uh, people from civil society at the university with my colleagues, of course, and we discussed how to work together. And uh, they suggested that they needed uh, some uh, training for uh, uh, human rights uh, activists working in the fields. Uh, as you know, uh, Turkey has a very uh, deep tradition in human rights activism. And uh, we realized that academy can be a bridge for civil society and the knowledge of human rights, theory and practice. So I started from the very beginning of my academic career uh, to work with uh, civil society. Uh, and uh, in time, uh, I approached to the civil society part and put a distance with the academy which uh, at the end led me to leave the university. But the main idea was to use the ter theoretical uh, information uh, in practice. And uh, in the middle of somewhere of this story, um, one of the laws that we will be talking today, Law 5651, uh, passed from the parliament and Human Rights Joint Platform, which I've worked with uh, for a very long time, asked me to write a report. And I knew at that time Yaman, my colleague was Yaman Akdeniz, was working on this and I, I proposed him to write and he said that, okay, I know the digital rights uh, well, but you know uh, the local law uh, well, so maybe we should do it together. So uh, it started in 2007 
uh, with the uh, entrance into law of law uh, 5651. And uh, since then, the government's uh, pressure on internet and freedom of expression uh, have uh, gradually uh, increased. Uh, so uh, I couldn't leave this uh, digital activism thing. And we have been challenging to the decisions of blocking um, restrictions uh, ever since then. So uh, my decision to be a human rights activist was a uh, intended decision, but digital rights activists uh, was a coincidence as a result of this first decision, I guess. Uh, as you were talking, Karam, I was reminded how actually law is can never be divorced from real life, the, the real context uh, situations. I mean, all academia or all uh, academic work is related to uh, real life. But uh, in case of law, you have to be really uh, involved with cases and uh, what's happening in uh, life in general, what's happening in the society, uh, what's happening to, in people's lives. Uh, so, Niktat, I'll turn to you now. Uh, please give us the perspective from Pakistan, but not uh, just Pakistan itself, which is a very interesting case in itself as a country, uh, but also the region in general, South Asia. How are digital right, rights utilized? How they cannot be uh, utilized and secured? What are the threats that you're facing? Uh, from which parties are you facing these threats? Uh, please give us the perspective from your region and your country. Uh, right. So uh, in uh, Pakistan, I would say the history of so the digital rights is something that 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 is not new, specifically from from my point of view or the digital rights activists who have been working for a free, safe and open Internet in the country for the last uh, almost 10 years and maybe more than that. Um, but I would say that the history of censorship uh, is uh, not really new. Um, uh, in 2006, uh, uh, when I was just starting my uh, legal practice, there was a, a ban on uh, blog spot. Uh, and that was a medium where people were writing their blogs. It was a new medium. Internet was, you know, like pretty new and had not many people had access to it. So uh, only those people who were privileged or, you know, like knew how to write in English and so they had access to the blog spot that was banned in the uh, during the dictatorship of um, uh, Musharraf. And so th that was the time where uh, first time uh, civil society activists, digital rights activists, they showed their concern uh, and they went to the Supreme Court of Pakistan. Uh, but then we saw the emerge uh, the emergence of uh, laws like uh, prevention of electronic crimes ordinance. Uh, again, that uh, was introduced by a dictator uh, and even after the uh, you know the dictatorship was ended, uh, uh, another government, a uh, democratic government, uh, more or less worked on the similar law. And now we have Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act, which was uh, enacted in 2016. Uh, and uh, due to these, so the, we have seen that the censorship has been happening in the online spaces uh, uh, in a more arbitrary way, uh, in a more ad hoc way by the regulatory body, which is called Pakistan Telecommunication Authority. Uh, and uh, there is absolutely no process that they uh, followed in the past. But then they, you know, made all these laws. Uh, in the name of protecting people uh, uh, against online harassment or against cyber crime and then we saw that now there is a legal cover to censor uh, online content uh, in the name of national security in the name of religion in the name of morality in the name of uh, you know uh, i mean you 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 name it there is a long list uh, so this is the kind of uh, you know censorship censorship situation that we see. But at the same time, I feel that uh, uh, when I started working on digital rights, uh, not many people knew about their rights. They had no idea 
that the same civil liberties that are enshrined in our Pakistani constitution, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of access to information, freedom of association and assembly, right to privacy, the, all these fundamental rights equally apply in the online spaces as well. And uh, so most of the time people used to take internet as a as an entertainment space or, you know, not really seeing it as the as a tool uh, or a space where they can exercise their rights. Uh, but now uh, I think it's because of lots of people who have been raising their voice against blocking and censorship, against surveillance technologies, against malware attacks that usually activists, journalists uh, and different vulnerable communities face. Uh, there is uh, an education and awareness where people have started talking about uh, their, uh, you know, safe online spaces or when their rights are curbed in the online spaces. And I, I'll talk more about the law uh, because I know that uh, I also have a example from Turkish law, but uh, uh, it's not just Pakistan. What we see in, even in Bangladesh, there is Digital Security Act. And now the name is digital security, meaning you are providing a digital security to the citizens of your country. but that the the objective of that law is not actually protecting people online but um violating their uh, fundamental rights in the online spaces and prosecuting people in the name of uh, you know a um, uh, lot of other exceptions that are mentioned uh, in 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 that law the same is the case with the other uh, you know um, uh, other jurisdictions like nepal like sri lanka like india and i would say this is a like a global trend where uh, governments are uh, coming coming up with all these new laws in the name of protecting data in the name of protecting citizens or protecting women against harassment but the actual intention is not protection the actual intention is something else which we usually see uh, um, uh, when uh, when the journalists are being arrested uh, under the you know like uh, uh, online um, uh, cyber uh, cyber laws or um, online defamation or stuff like that when they use uh, from those laws uh, so yeah i mean this is the current uh, state where the many laws are being introduced and citizens are really not up to the speed or really don't know uh, how these laws are being misused against them and not just citizens but i would say also judiciary is not really aware uh, and the other stakeholders how to understand these laws how to set a good precedent or uh, or, or define a good jurisprudence uh, when it comes to these these laws only the investigation agency or the law enforcement agency uh, really know um, how to use those laws um, and most of the time without procedures and processes and accountability and oversight. Uh, Niktal, I'm hearing uh, many of the uh, echoes that, 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 uh, of Turkey uh, when you, as you're speaking, because actually uh, our cases are not worlds apart or the region in general, South uh, Asian uh, cases are not so much distant for, uh, to Turkey. Uh, before turning to Kerem though, I, I want to ask you uh, something else, because uh, it's, we are always talking about the government, but how, how about the other parties? For example, how are, uh, are the social media co companies uh, a partner in uh, trying to prevent the shrinking of digital right space? Or are they uh, uh, a hindrance? They are, they are, are they causing uh, other obstacles uh, bef uh, for util utilizing uh, securing of uh, digital rights? Uh, how do you assess their role? Uh, so I so think in uh, countries, uh, I think in countries like ours, uh, so uh, we all have issues with the social media companies. Um, I'm um, 
I'm sitting on um, Facebook Independent Oversight Board, and the board is actually there to hold Facebook accountable. Um, and I think uh, we we uh, um, there are so many digital rights activists, including myself, who have been criticizing these companies because of their roles. I think one challenge that I see in my country, and I think that sort of applies to all uh, other countries where the rule where rule of law is not really strong. Companies speak to the government and the regulatory bodies uh, without uh, being transparent. So, for instance, we see this in Pakistan. Many companies uh, speak to regularly to the government, but we really don't know the detail that what kind of you know uh, meetings that they are having, what kind of agreements they are making. Um, it, a, a small example is that uh, TikTok, for instance, was banned in Pakistan a few weeks ago. And uh, the and they the uh, Pakistan Telecommunication Authority really didn't follow you know the law and just you know banned TikTok because they said that oh we have been receiving lots of complaints uh, uh, that the content on TikTok is immoral and obscene and is against the Islamic values of our society so they just decided to block it. And uh, and then TikTok uh, administration, you know, they started talking to Pakistani regulators. And then one fine day, you know, the P the regulatory body uh, announced that they are uh, lifting the ban on TikTok. So you know, these kind of actions and decisions um, uh, make you very uh, doubtful about the role of different companies. That what kind of uh, things that they are agreeing on with the government bodies, right? Uh, so I see that they, we, you know, really need to like keep pushing these companies for being more transparent. They cannot simply do the same thing in Europe, right? They cannot do the same thing in US and UK. They know that they can get away with these kind of things in our countries because the users who actually should have the actual power doesn't have that power and doesn't have the knowledge and awareness. So uh, the role of social media companies, I see it's uh, uh, it has always been problematic in countries like ours, but I see that's why our, our work is very important to keep pushing, you know, uh, not just the government, but also social media companies and keep holding them accountable. Of course, it adds a lot into our free labor that we do all the time. And uh, I also want to ask you the uh, last question, then turn to Kara. Uh, defamation is being an issue in Turkey recently. Uh, how are the religious bodies in general or organizations or associations, uh, sects, uh, whatever, uh, are, how are they uh, affecting your work? Uh, are, are they uh, taking you as the enemy or is it a big problem uh, to have to deal with them? <laughs> How is the situation? I uh, so um, um, I uh, to be very honest, uh, I, I am very cautious when I'm online. Um, I I think I'm more aware about the uh, uh, cyber defamation laws, uh, and they are uh, very. Uh, I mean, we I have seen lots of cases and examples, and even journalists who reach out to us and activists who reach out to us. Uh, very regularly who face uh, a cyber criminal defamation. So, um, um, I mean, as a woman facing rape threats and, uh, you know, all kind of abuse and hate speech is, is such a norm. It has become a normal thing for activists like myself and several other women journalists who have been facing a lot of abuse and hate speech online. Um, but uh, I would say that uh, the defamation is something that lots of other activists and journalists are facing. And, re and since the law, the prevention of, of electronic crimes law, the cyber crime law that I was talking about earlier, is actually be weaponized against uh, journalists and activists, especially this particular provision uh, around criminal defamation. And it, it makes me wonder, and also other digital rights activists have been pushing that when you have a civil defamation in the country, when you have a criminal defamation in the penal code, what is the need of making another defamation law in the cybercrime law, right? But I think they, these kind of provisions basically tell you that uh, powerful bodies and actors want to exert more power and that's why these provisions are added into different other laws to you know regulate 
not only content but regulate people online so the I, I would say that I also self-censor myself and I have seen lots of other women self-censor themselves online just because we don't want to uh, face, uh, you know, defamation, uh, uh, not just in the cybercrime law, but also in the Pakistan penal code and, and, the, other, uh, and the other laws that uh, covers uh, defamation. Don't worry, Nika, you're not the only one self-censoring. <laughs> I, I myself uh, undergo these uh, troubles every day, let's say. Uh, we always weigh what to say, what not to say, but we still try to carry on uh, with speaking out. Uh, Cam, so uh, you've been very active with the uh, new in internet law uh, in Turkey, it's not becoming so new. It's not so new anymore at all. We are getting used to it. It's becoming a part of our lives. Uh, it has become instantly a part of our lives. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to tell the story. But it's uh, from uh, Nikat, uh, we, we heard, and it's our case uh, in Turkey too, that uh, digital rights is not just about the, the, the digital uh, sphere, the online sphere. But uh, they involve all rights, actually, all the sphere of uh, freedom of expression, uh, all rights and freedoms. Uh, so please do tell uh, us about how the issue evolved in Turkey, uh, both regarding the in, uh, new Internet law uh, and there were also new uh, the developments. Uh, some fines uh, were imposed on the social media companies recently. I myself don't know much about it uh, due to the hectic uh, uh, agenda that going on so, so i'm sure our audience will be interested in that but also uh, really do, do give us the general perspective what has been happening in turkey okay uh we, we keep saying new by the way uh, nothing is new in turkey you know uh we enacted law then amended in numerous times and one of those laws is internet law and it entered into force in 2007, uh, so relatively old, uh, considering the how uh, digital life have uh, has grown since then. Uh, but I think we need to look at the background to understand why the law was um, uh, enacted at that time and why it has been amended several times. Uh, until 2007, um, internet was not that important uh, for the government. The government became into power in 2002, and in the first five years, the, the main idea was to control state apparatus plus media and other stuff. So the government was targeting the printed media and the visual media, uh, and internet's uh, effect in our lives were limited uh, uh, at that time. Uh, but in 2007, uh, there, there, there were very important uh, political developments, including uh, the uh, election of a new president. Uh, the government became uh, powerful enough to control all state institutions. Only the exception was judiciary, and I'll come to that uh, in 2007. Uh, and at that year, uh, the law on internet, uh, 5651, passed from the parliament. Uh, in a very similar way, uh, the government uh, argued that uh, uh, the, 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 the target of the uh, legislation was to protect children. So the obscenity was at the heart of uh, the story at the beginning. Uh, they claimed that they uh, would protect children against obscenity and other crimes. So uh, in the original form, there was only one article about uh, blocking uh, content on the internet. It was Article 8. And according to Article 8, uh, there, there, there's a list of crimes. Uh, if uh, there is suspicion, strong suspicion, uh, that th that crime uh, has been committed, then a blocking order uh, might be uh, delivered by a criminal peace court. At, at that time, it was criminal peace court, not criminal peace judge. However, it didn't stop there. Uh, you can follow the Turkish political history from the internet law. Uh, in 2014, 
two new provisions were added uh, to the law, which three, sorry, three different uh, provisions. One of them has not been used a lot, so uh, we don't know uh, it very well, but two others uh, have been used uh, very frequently. In 2014, following Gezi events and then the uh, probe allegations uh, against the government, corruption allegations against government, the government uh, inserted a new provision uh, in the law, Article 9. This uh, claims to be protecting individual rights. Why it came in 2014? Uh, you might remember at the end of 2013, there was a clash between the Gulenists and, and the government and a lot of uh, recordings uh, belong to the ministers, uh, their families uh, have been released through social media. So uh, the government just uh, months after uh, this uh, de development uh, inserted a new provision and uh, gave power to the criminal peace judges to block websites uh, or uh, URLs when uh, a personal right is violated. The result is uh, that almost anything critical against the government now can be uh, categorized as um, breaching uh, personal rights. For instance, if you r report uh, the ministers uh, transactions in, in Can Channel Istanbul. This, this is a new uh, project uh, uh, announced by the president. Uh, close to Istanbul, there will be a huge channel um, uh, connecting Black Sea to, to the Marmara Sea. And uh, one of the ministers bought some uh, assets next to this project because he knew that there will be that project. And this was reported by some media. Uh, when it was, at the moment, it's impossible to report this in conventional media in Turkey. So the alternative media uh, made news about this and uh, the minister applied to the criminal peace jo uh, uh, judge and uh, argued that this reporting violated his personal rights. He didn't say that, uh, no, I didn't buy anything. But he only said that this violated my uh, personal rights. So this was the first uh, amendment in the law, first important amendment. Secondly, in 2015, this time uh, Article 8A was uh, inserted to uh, to the same law, and this is uh, about uh, um, banning orders to protect national security, public order, prevention of crime. Why did it happen? Uh, the, the, there were first Gezi events, then um, armed clashes in uh, the Kurdish region. So the government decided to block everything on the ground that's news concerning these clashes and uh, serious human rights violations uh, breach public order. Uh, and uh, with this new provision, uh, thousands of uh, um, news reports as well as uh, websites uh, have been uh, blocked. Uh, finally, the new amendment, why they needed this last amendment, uh, the criminal peace judge uh, system created in 2014 uh, guarantees uh, the government's request to be decided by the criminal system. However, uh, if you don't comply with the decision, what's going to happen? Uh, personally, if you don't comply, you're in trouble. But if the company is not located in Turkey, as in the case of social media companies, then uh, it's impossible to uh, force them to uh, implement those decisions delivered by criminal peace judges. So uh, the government realized at one point uh, they they had bargains, uh, as Nikat said, uh, with Twitter and Facebook, and they got a lot from them. But uh, Turkey, you can follow from the Twitter's uh, 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 transparency reports, uh, is the leading country in blocking content in the world. At one point, 
Twitter decided not to implement at least some of those decisions. So you, you get decisions from criminal peace judges, but you can you can get uh, at least all uh, be implemented by the criminal peace judges. So the government decided to control the social media as, as a last uh, attempt to control whole information uh, flowing in the country by uh, requiring those companies to uh, appoint a representative in Turkey. So the first uh, reason is that to get decisions against social media companies to be implemented. But secondly, the government also uh, asks those uh, companies to localize their uh, data, which will mean that uh, when an investigation is conducted against a person, they will go and ask to the social media company to uh, inform uh, Turkish authorities uh, about the inf uh, information about the person uh, who is under investigation. This is so critical and dangerous. If uh, those companies decide to uh, appoint a representative in Turkey, and if they localize their data in Turkey, the government will be able to reach all the information uh, about social media users, including, including those who want to stay uh, anonymous. Uh, the idea is that uh, to catch everyone, uh, not only using social media uh, openly, but also who are critical but anonymous uh, on social media. How about this uh, recent fine imposed on the uh, social media companies? There was a talk of that 10 million lira yeah. was imposed. Uh, it's it, it's hefty uh, by international standards as well. I think it's a million dollars per company. Is it? Uh, million, uh, my math. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, uh, did, uh, this is I mean, if it was only 1 million uh, euro, uh, as you're right, that wouldn't be that important for those companies. However, uh, new uh, sanctions will follow this, uh, as you know. Um, the law said after entry into force of that provision, that provision that requires companies to uh, appoint a representative in Turkey, it says that for the first month, if they don't appoint then 10 million Turkish lira will be imposed. Uh, then in the following months, this will be uh, 30 million uh, Turkish liras, 3 million uh, euros. Then uh, if they do not comply with uh, this uh, second sanction, uh, third one is uh, prohibition of advertisement on those uh, social media companies. You won't be able to uh, advertise on Facebook, Twitter, if they don't appoint uh, a representative in Turkey. Uh, this uh, sanction will last for three months. And at the end of three months, uh, the traffic of those websites will be uh, squeezed up to uh, 50%. And in May 2021, it will be uh, 90% uh, bent uh, squeeze, uh, which means that if those companies do not appoint uh, representatives in Turkey, in May, we won't be able to access Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube and others. Uh, and although uh, Facebook didn't make an official statement about this, uh, it is known and uh, Facebook did not deny this, uh, it's known that they will not appoint. Uh, I guess uh, uh, this is a secret, no uh, statement or uh, rumor is available about Twitter, but Twitter, I guess, wouldn't appoint uh, uh, representative uh, as well. This, this will mean that if nothing changes until May, uh, all leading uh, social media uh, networks uh, will uh, won't, won't be available in Turkey uh, next year this time. My uh, expectation is that the government 
do not want to uh, retreat from its position. But I think to overcome this crisis, they will ask constitutional court to annul the new provision. In this, in this way, they will blame the constitutional court, while on the other hand, uh, social media companies uh, will continue to operate uh, in Turkey. But this is, this is not because of my legal um, capacity. This is just a conspiracy th theory that I'm producing now. Uh, I'll c come back to you, Kerem, uh, but uh, I'll just want to return to Niktat uh, to ask, is there a similar situation like this with social media companies in Pakistan or the region? Uh, is there a, a, a clash of wills in that sense, you think? Or is there a threat that also in Pakistan or the region, uh, the, uh, such companies will be forced out of business to be there uh, because of their deal? <laughs> uh, relationship yeah. uh, status complicated with the uh, government. So I, when when Karim was talking about this, I was just um, smiling because uh, that's the similar situation in Pakistan. Uh, there is this uh, new uh, regulation rules, basically, uh, which is called Citizen Protection Against Online Harms Rules. Um, and under these rules, uh, the rules are made uh, under the Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act that I mentioned before. Um, and uh, these rules give power to the regulatory body, which is Pakistan Telecommunication Authority, to push companies to uh, open up their offices in Pakistan uh, within 90 uh, uh, days of the you know, notification of such these rules. Um, and uh, it, or and also appoint their focal person uh, in Pakistan. So that means that these social media companies like Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter, uh, TikTok, you know, all these companies, uh, ha ha they have to have an office in Pakistan in case they fail to do so, their, uh, you know, uh, uh, access to their platforms will be shut down. Uh, then this is nothing new, although the rule, like, putting them in rules is actually new that they are now making it a regular this entire framework in into a like a legislative framework but even before that the government of pakistan banned youtube for three years uh in pakistan because of the blasphemy uh and um so the the, the users of uh the internet users didn't have access to the such a big platform like YouTube for three years. So which sort of uh, shows and very clearly tells us that uh, blocking these platforms is actually, uh, you know, not an issue for the government. And uh, introduction of such rules uh, are actually, you know, telling these companies uh, or sort of threatening them that if you won't abide by our local laws or won't listen to us uh then you know uh just face the consequences and i think like uh turkey i don't um i highly doubt that in absence of the data protection law uh or uh you know any other privacy protections uh pushing companies to open up their offices here uh, and we know that the, there is a practice of, you know, asking these companies for users' data or taking down content. And uh, uh, there are like other uh, uh, censorship uh, that has been taking place around uh, sensitive uh, actors in Pakistan. Uh, so there is a massive fear among stakeholders that, uh, including social media companies who, by the way, also sent an open letter to the Prime Minister of Pakistan through their coalition, which is Asia Internet Coalition, uh, and uh, uh, showed their concern that uh, the uh, process around making such rules are very problem. It's very problematic because it was first not consultative, and uh, and and the kind of conditions and 
terms that they are pushing these companies to follow are actually impractical um, but we really don't know how these companies will uh, we we have still heard that the uh, that the notification that these rules are notified but uh, nothing has happened like not not many people have seen the copy while i was you know like listening to uh, karim i just looked into uh, internet and found the copy on ministry of it's website um, so we don't know the future of uh, these uh, of such uh, actions that the government is taking but for sure we are moving towards the same direction that uh, you know the that, that Turkey has. Also, the rules uh, basically talk about that the servers uh, will be in also in Pakistan. So there will be like local servers here while the company will set up her its office here. So just imagine where the journalists are being prosecuted under the cybercrime law very regularly and often. Uh, what kind of repercussions actions uh, will, you know, like bring uh, specifically around such rules and regulations and legislations yeah uh, i want to ask you both also just quickly uh, is there a difference between uh, so to say western companies uh, and uh, tiktok for example uh, is there a difference in the government's uh, treatment of these companies uh, also considering international relations aspects uh, of the issue uh, and also uh, how, how are the companies behaving themselves? Uh, does a Chinese company like TikTok uh, do something completely different than, for example, Twitter, Facebook, etc.? So, Kera, first you. Um, first of all, it's really interesting to listen to uh, Nikat because uh, I, I know that autocratic regimes are uh, transferring know-how on how to restrict freedom of expression. Uh, and Turkey is very good in this uh, field, uh, in, in the field of digital rights, how to restrict digital rights. Uh, and I think this is one of the reasons that those companies do not want to appoint representatives in Turkey, because if they do so, they will have to do the same thing everywhere. Then the Twitter and YouTube will lose all their meaning. And I think I can come to your question, Sezin, from here. Uh, uh, in Turkey, the difference between uh, different social media platforms is that uh, whether they uh, spread political content or not. I think this is this is the answer. And uh, and second, the point is whether those companies comply with the request of the government. Um, Twitter uh, rejected more requests from the government than Facebook. So until this uh, last amendment, uh, the, the relation between uh, the government and the Facebook was uh, quite reasonable and fine for the government. But uh, I know that the policy of Facebook changed and this is one of the results. Uh, Facebook now is uh, adopting a more uh, pro human rights uh, position and that's why they don't want to come. Uh, but when it comes to TikTok, I've been working in this field for a very long time, you know, but I haven't heard a lot of complaints about TikTok from the government side. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there have been private uh, conflicts between parties be because of the content uh, shared in uh, TikTok, uh, but uh, the government does not complain a lot. But the law says that if you have more than one million uh, members, then you have to appoint uh, a, a representative. Uh, this means that uh, TikTok will have to do so. I don't know why T TikTok hasn't done this uh, so far. I haven't heard any uh, explanation statement from TikTok uh, on this, but I'm, I, I guess that they, their reason might be different than uh, Facebook and Twitter, uh, which is more uh, freedom of expression uh, based arguments. Uh, uh, but as I said, uh, I don't know uh, about talk, TikTok. Uh, and uh, Nick Tat, uh, we heard that uh, TikTok is facing its own troubles in Pakistan. Uh, how about there? Are they behaving indifferently? How are their relations, uh, how, uh, how are their relations with the government? So uh, this is interesting because uh, when um, 
we thought we, pa Pakistan and China very they are very uh, close uh, in terms of politics and you know like both countries call each other you know brother countries so it is by the way Turkey and Pakistan also um, and uh, when the TikTok was banned I was expecting that the Chinese government might raise uh, you know uh, eyebrows or you know raise their concerns but nothing happened at the political end uh, while uh, you know the one thing that I saw that since TikTok is a platform which is uh, being used more by the working class or the class that it, that is not on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or cannot access those platforms because of maybe you know the language issue or the other barriers TikTok sort of provided that space to the uh, working class in Pakistan and um, there has been like 43 million downloads uh, in in Pakistan so far when the TikTok was banned um, and uh, no so uh, we really didn't see the political sort of climate uh, kind of uh, get, getting intense or anything but we saw that TikTok has been in con uh, they, they were in conversation with the government and um, different uh, tiktok uh, one different one tiktok user and some uh, some other people also went to the high courts and challenged the ban uh, but in the meanwhile we heard from tiktok and the pakistan telecommunication authority that they are lifting the ban after tiktok agreed that they will actively look for obscene and immoral content on their platform uh but that was a very general statement you you see when i say the transparency of these companies it's not it doesn't only mean that uh you know how they and who who they are to decide immoral and obscene for me right uh how the few people sitting in the regulatory body decide uh what the millions of people should watch uh, on such platform um, in in country like Pakistan, you know, like a woman wearing jeans can be obscene for some people or a woman, you know, uh, uh, walking uh, uh, on the road can be obscene and immoral for some people. So I think this is a very gray area and I have a lot of reservation uh, when companies agree to such uh, conditions and on what basis they you know uh, uh, they will be uh, moderating the content and i think that's the same question that goes to tiktok but uh, but politically uh, no one raised any question and i think maybe the chinese government raised uh, their concern but maybe that's all behind the closed doors nothing appeared on media uh, so yeah, I mean, this is the that, that's how the TikTok was unbanned in Pakistan, which I feel is not uh, it, it actually set a, a bad precedent because it first it allowed the regulatory body to arbitrarily ban the uh, ban the app and then again arbitrarily unban the app. I mean, how, why you are not following the process or what, where is the process or, you know, uh, it's also unconstitutional that a body decide uh, that this is obscene and immoral on the behalf of millions of users. Uh, Karen, now I'll turn to you uh, and uh, follow up on what you were uh, talking uh, about. Uh, our panel is about sh shrinking spaces and in Turkey we, we have been uh, witnessing a shrinking of uh, free, uh, of space in terms of freedom, freedoms and rights uh, and an unprecedented scale according to some human rights activists. So uh, how do you think the di digital rights in general are uh, tying to all other uh, freedom of express, expression issues in Turkey, uh, the other cases of uh, journalists uh, in jail, human rights uh, activists in jail, politicians in jail, and the list goes on, so and so forth. Yeah. So uh, please enlighten us. Uh, I, I think uh, the rights on uh, digital sphere cannot be divorced from uh, the main human rights problems in Turkey, starting from rule of law and independent and impartiality of judiciary. 
let me uh, explain with uh, with a basic example. I uh, mentioned criminal peace judges. Uh, blocking orders uh, are uh, being given by criminal peace judges. And this new criminal peace justice system was created in 2014. And uh, when uh, a criminal peace judge decides to ban a website, uh, that decision can only go to the next criminal peace judge. Why this is important? There are only 10 criminal peace judges in Ankara. They can detain anyone they want. They can block any website they want. So, uh, for instance, about the application of Article 8A uh, of the uh, Internet law, this is the one about a public order national security. Uh, only one judge in Gölbaşı, Ankara, Gölbaşı is a sub-province of Ankara, uh, decided uh, thousands of people blocked in Turkey. Why Gölbaşı? Because the telecommunication order was next to Gölbaşı and there was just one uh, criminal peace judge there. And this criminal peace judge uh, has not rejected a single request coming from the uh, public authorities. We are talking about tens of thousands of URLs, not in a single one. That person decided that, no, no, okay, this doesn't uh, breach public order. So uh, that's why uh, rights on digital uh, platforms are connected to uh, main human rights issues in Turkey. And secondly, uh, we're talking about shrinking space for civil society. Civil, uh, civil society uh, keeps creating its own places and mostly on internet and digital uh, arena. Uh, if you can't uh, get your printed media, you can create um, alternative media digital uh, uh, portals like Duvar, like Dikan, like Bienet and others. So uh, they have become very active in Turkey and uh, social media and uh, the rise of using social media in Turkey helped them uh, to grow. Uh, people turn to those alternative news sources instead of uh, uh, conventional uh, media sources to learn the truth. So now if you on the one hand block news uh, of those alternative media sources, and on the other hand, you prosecute journalists for what they write on uh, those digital platforms, then inevitably the digital sphere created by civil society is also being shrinked. And uh, at the moment, we don't know how to uh, overcome this. Uh, when, when I um, raise my concerns about this, a lot of uh, friends uh, or citizens say that, okay, we will find technical uh, ways to overcome this problem. Yes, we can overcome some of this by using BP and other, uh, and other tools, but uh, Turkey uh, is an 83 million uh, population uh, country and uh, those alternative media sources are reaching uh, a, a lot of people. Not all of them will be able to uh, reach and access to those um, alternative media sources when the government uh, keeps imposing new measures and sanctions uh, over them. So uh, I think we cannot separate these criminal measures against journalists from administrative measures uh, imposed on uh, digital media. And of course, all of them should be connected to the uh, main problem uh, rule of law and uh, independent and impartial judiciary in Turkey. Uh, now I want to turn to Nikta uh, and all, uh, talk about a very important uh, area uh, in digital rights and uh, in freedoms and rights in general, the gender side of the story. Uh, you've been working uh, We've been focusing on uh, preventing harassment of women uh, and those who are suffering from their uh, gender identity online. Uh, so please tell us about your work and uh, what you're facing in Pakistan and uh, globally in general. Uh, how are the women specific, suffering specifically uh, from uh, 
curbing or uh, shrinking of space of their digital rights and also uh, not just women but all those who are uh, who are uh, who have having problems because of their gender uh, identity uh, so you know as i said in the beginning that uh, main motivation behind my work was to focus on digital rights from the gender lens and uh, and that's why i guess a lot of women slowly and gradually when the access to internet and information and, com and communication technology increased in pakistan um, um, women also started getting access though it was very difficult when you know when i started working back in 2005 2006 it was not easy for women to get access to mobile phone or internet it was it was always uh, seen as with suspicion that oh why she needs a mobile phone why she wants to use an internet why uh, she wants to be on uh, social media before facebook we had orkut which was really famous and i remember that i used to use orkut uh, uh, while hiding from my family uh, so it was the case and and I was a lawyer so it and just imagine you know the women who uh, were um, you know who, who belonged to uh, not really educated progressive families uh, it was a huge issue for them to access mobile phone or internet slowly and gradually the trend changed and now we see that women also uh, have access but still there is a huge gender digital divide in pakistan um in rural in urban areas um especially in cities uh, it's it, it's not a taboo anymore uh, but in rural areas which is 70 percent of pakistan's population uh women still you know they uh, are not really allowed to uh, own mobile phone not all women uh either these are you know older women in the family or uh you know they can they, mostly they cannot buy a sim card in their own name so the male elder basically buy a sim card on their uh you know uh, national id card uh, copy um so there's even their numbers are you know in the name of their male elders in the family um and when they use online spaces so because there is this notion uh the social norm in uh, that you know if you are not supposed to use online spaces uh that's why when they face harassment or any kind of hate speech or violence uh you know they they do do not uh, or cannot reach out to the their immediate support system uh, their families or you know the people that they sort of the friends maybe you know the the, the people in the cl close circle because the first thing that they do is to victim blame them that oh why you did that why you posted that picture why you were using you know why you started talking to such and such person um there was no need at all so you know when they victim blame that's where women take a step back and they really don't know how to deal with that it's changing slowly and gradually but uh, one form of violence that i see is where it's pervasive in in our culture that is black blackmailing women over their intimate images and videos um or 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 dissemination of non consensual use of intimate images which is called ncui uh, and that's a very common in pakistan because um, perpetrators who blackmail women over these images they know that these women have nowhere to go they cannot seek support because uh, if they they would do people will blame them that oh why at first place you sent this picture to such person so that means you were in illicit relationship with that person which more which sometimes especially in far flung areas or tribal areas uh it uh leads to honor kill that woman so honor killing another issue which is very co common in pakistan and women are being killed in the name of honor because of such strange and weird reasons the honor of the entire family is connected to our bodies uh, so that similar thing goes on to internet space and the usage of our mobile phone uh, last year uh, three women were killed in in the 
uh, tribal areas of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa because um, they somebody filmed them uh, on their from their mobile phone while they were just laughing, and this is just you know like even the like thought of it that women were laughing and someone made their video on their mobile phone and disseminated that video in the village which you know that their their respective tribe thought that it's uh these women have damaged the honor of the tribe so they killed them and few years ago a few women were just clapping you know in a wedding uh in a in a in a room and their male relative made a video the women were not even aware that you know someone someone was making their video and that video was also disseminated uh, from one mobile to another mobile phone in that village and again those women were killed and the men also so you see there are like different aspects of uh, 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 and the vulnerabilities of women using internet and mobile phones uh, in the rural areas and then in the areas um, and I think the fear of being victim blame and slut shame is something that hold, uh, hold them back to reach out to the support system. So that's why we started Cyber Harassment Helpline in uh, Pakistan in 2016. And the idea was that not every person, not just women, but also non-binary uh, 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 people who do not want to, you know, identify with any gender, uh, and sexual minorities and religious minorities. They do not want to reach out to the authorities uh, because they first they fear that their, their data might be misused. And the second thing is that they don't even have a support system uh, to, you know, like go with them to these authorities and follow up with the cases. The justice system, the criminal justice system is really broken, especially for the vulnerable and marginalized groups. Uh, not ev not every person has a capacity and privilege to follow up with the cases for years and years. So what they do is they just try to find other ways to deal with, uh, you know, such kind of abuse and hate speech and harassment and blasphemy allegations through different other means and not through legislation or to, through the through the uh, through the investigative agency. So the cyber harassment helpline basically does this work. It's a confidential helpline where anyone can call us. We didn't specify it just to the activists, journalists, or religious minorities or sexual minorities, but to anyone where we have seen that even in this patriarchal society, men are also abused so much and they cannot even talk to anyone because the, the whole concept of masculinity is so toxic and so strong that they they don't even think that they you know they they don't want to reach out to anyone because then the then the mess the norms around masculinity sort of you know doesn't really fulfill a macho man in our society so we receive lots of complaints and uh, and we support them through uh tell them like what are the legal options available to them but also tell them like what are the digital security uh tips that they can follow and then you know make their online experiences safer and the third thing is mental health counseling uh, it's so important to you know bring people into their stable mental state when they reach out to us sometimes they are so they are panicked and they just so they're like people who are uh, in the past who were suicidal especially younger women uh they wanted to commit suicide and they reached out to us that you guys are our last hope and if you can support me i mean just tell me what i should do i want this content to be removed on, from social media platform or i want this blackmailing to be ended uh and i think for us the first thing is to bring them into a stable mental state where they can you know make informed decisions but it also sort of it has given us so much information and knowledge and you know made us realize the gaps in the law the gaps in the investigation agencies work uh, the social media companies how why it's not working you know their reporting mechanisms are not working in our context what are the things that they can do so you know they're like these things that we are uh, sort of uh, addressing through the cyber harassment helpline but i would say that um 
vulnerable and marginalized communities including young women and girls uh, every single day on internet is a you know it's a, uh, it's not normal for them their experiences are very different than the male in, male internet users uh, the sexualized and gendered nature of attacks make it more difficult for them to you know use online spaces freely Uh, Karam, uh, do you think that uh, the, uh, all these uh, uh, issues that about gender that Nikat is talking about uh, resonates with Turkey? Uh, in Turkey, the, for example, uh, the uh, uh, high-profile uh, murder cases, which became high-profile because uh, they were uh, discussed a lot uh, in the social sphere, uh, violence uh, the, uh, against women, uh, such cases uh, have become an issue Uh, specifically because of the online sphere, uh, in my view. How, how do you assess that? Uh, is, uh, digi uh, digi are the dig uh, digital platforms advancing women right women's rights in Turkey uh, or in general gender rights or uh, is it the other way around? Um, I mean, uh, in this field, uh, digital rights uh, mirrors what we have in, in, in other fields of the life. So, Uh, on the one hand, yes, uh, uh, digital platforms provide an excellent place for to organize uh, women's rights groups uh, to help each other, uh, like uh, in Pakistan, uh, uh, so social media and digital uh, platforms sometimes save the life. But on the other hand, yes, it, it gives a lot of opportunity for blackmailing, uh, harassing, Uh, women and other uh, gender identities. Uh, we know that LGBTI groups are uh, under serious threat in Turkey. This includes uh, social media. Uh, if, if you um, openly um, talk about your uh, sexual identity, then you might be uh, attacked for this. You might uh, be following uh, a very well-known public figure, um, uh, Taylor, who left the country. Uh, she, uh, uh, I, I forgot his name. Anyway, he's, I mean, he uh, Barbara Shansal. Uh, Barbara Shansal. But Barbara Shansal uh, doesn't hide his uh, gender identity. And he shares how this uh, identity being perceived by, by people and he, how he, he, he's being insulted, threatened by, by people. And it's interesting to see that uh, this is merged with his uh, political choices. He's known as a, a gov government critic and his uh, gender identity is being used uh, to insult someone who is acting against the government. So one of the problems in Turkey is uh, that this all insults threatening blackmailing thing is working uh, as a one-way traffic uh, if you're pro you, if you're a pro-government person you can say anything and if you are um, uh, brought to uh, judicial authorities then those words are seen as uh, freedom of expression but if you are against the government you say the same thing then you find yourself uh, in trouble Uh, you know that uh, uh, around 100,000 uh, uh, people have been uh, investigated for insulting to presidents and in uh, more than 30,000 cases, uh, prosecutors uh, initiated uh, criminal cases in, for, uh, after those investigations. And uh, to the best of my uh, mind, um, the, the, the president uh, has never lost a single Okay, for criminal or civil course, he's always right. Uh, but when he says something and he is sued, then whatever he says, it is seen as a, a freedom of expression. It happened uh, recently in the case of Baskin Oran versus Suleiman Soylu. Uh, you might remember Baskin Oran uh, complained uh, about the wordings used against him by the Minister of uh, Interior. Uh, it, this was a civil case, not a criminal one. Uh, but the court said that uh, Suleiman Soylu had freedom of expression to say uh, everything. So uh, it depends who you are. If you are a pro-government person, 
uh, you are attacked uh, as a woman, uh, then your rights might be protected. But if you uh, are uh, uh, voicing the uh, uh, demands of uh, minority groups, uh, even when you are using your democratic rights to criticize someone, it might be seen as a threat, as a um, insult, de defamation, and so on. So I think uh, there are similarities between Pakistan and, uh, and Turkey uh, about this gender issues. But I think uh, we need to add, and I guess it's also uh, might, it might also be similar in Pakistan. Uh, a different line should be added to this. This is the political position or ethnic identity or the religious identity of the person in addition to the uh, gender identity. A very good example again is uh, Mark Arisean, uh, an Armenian Turkish. Uh, he was the uh, MP of the uh, ruling party and uh, when he died he was respected and he was honored by uh, pro-government people as well as uh, digital media users. But uh, another Armenian uh, MP, Armenian origin MP, Garopailan, uh, is receiving threats, uh, insults, everything uh, daily basis, on daily basis. And uh, as far as I know, no one has been prosecuted so far for threatening uh, got a pile on, on on the internet. So uh, this is this is a one way traffic that that I uh, call. I also want to ask you how this uh, Corona crisis is affecting us in the digital sphere in general in digital right, uh, rights uh, arena. We are all online now. Uh, are digital rights uh, becoming more prominent, more emphasized, uh, and therefore more attacked uh, in our contemporary times? How did the coronavirus affect your work personally, and also uh, the d digital uh, rights uh, area in general? For example, are there also good examples in activism? Niktat, you first. All right. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, COVID uh, um, brought some challenges and also opportunities uh, in the way in a way that uh, a lot of people who uh, were working from their offices, you know, I think some for some it became a little easier to work online. Uh, but at the same time, I think people who have children and they also, you know, started uh, their online classes, I think it became a real issue. But I think the main issue that we saw uh, emerged um, during lockdown, especially, uh, was uh, the, gen the digital divide and the gender digital divide. So uh, when schools, colleges, universities, offices were closed, people from different uh, uh, villages or towns or uh, different provinces, uh, they went back to their, uh, you know, native uh, cities and uh, which sort of, uh, uh, and, and especially students when they went back to their villages and towns, uh, they were forced to take online classes and they couldn't because in their respective villages and areas, internet was not available. And it was not always the issue of uh, accessibility, but also there were some uh, areas, specifically in Khyber Pakhtunkha um, and the tribal areas where the internet is blocked. You know, there are shutdowns uh, in the name of, you know, uh, uh, national security or because the region uh, has a conflict. So uh, we saw different like students, not just ma male students, but also women students in some parts of Balochistan, in some parts of uh, Khyber Pakhtunkha. They started protesting, saying the Higher Education Commission uh, and their respective universities to stop online classes uh, because they don't have access 
they their demands and we as a digital rights uh, organization issued a set of demands to the ministry of information communication technology addressing the president the the prime minister uh, that how they can uh, address the issues around accessibility of internet uh, during covid it was not just uh, the uh, the uh, issue around uh, uh, education but also um, i mean you know people in the villages absolutely had no idea what corona is a lot of uh, government many com campaigns awareness raising campaigns that they were doing around covid were, were on uh, social media so when the those people who do not even have access to internet how they can even know uh, what exactly corona is and how they can you know deal with the virus and you know uh, how they can um, uh, take care of their loved ones and it's not just the lack of internet but because the in these villages the power outages uh, take place uh, probably you know like 20 hours out of 24 7 uh 24 hours so you just see you know they don't have uh electricity they don't have internet so you know it's uh, uh th so these were the challenges that uh we thought we sort of thought as as an organization and the other digital rights activists that uh it, covid is also an opportunity to make government realize that uh, the gender divide the digital divide and the gender digital divide it was always there it's now due to covid that people are raising their voice and protesting um for me i think uh, it actually <laughs> increased my work a lot i feel like i have no personal life i'm working all the time uh, and you know like in uh, uh, there are like several civil society organizations and human rights groups who uh, it was a new normal for them. For us as a digital rights organization, using online spaces for meetings and sessions was really not new. But for other traditional human rights organizations, it was uh, a challenge for them to uh, you know, move on to online spaces and then do their all work on internet. So we also, as an organization, started building their capacity and, uh, you know, sharing our practices and knowledge and skills that how they can use online spaces and continue their work through internet. Um, so yeah, I mean, I feel that they're like these challenges uh, that arose during lockdown and still are there, by the way. But also, I saw that the. Uh, yeah, how the COVID tracing apps, uh, it, while you know they were they were popular in other Western countries, in Pakistan also there was a tracing app uh, that was uh, being introduced by the government, and we raised our uh, concerns around the lack of privacy and data protection of such an app. Uh, so we don't really know like who uh, uh, who uh, uh, how they dealt with the. Uh, with the issues around app, but a lot of people who were contracting COVID uh, during that time, their friends and their relatives and uh, people around them started getting messages uh, from the government uh, that, oh, you might have come across a COVID positive patient, so just be careful. And they it freaked them out. And they were like, how did they do know that there is a COVID positive person around me? and uh and i and that's where we raised um uh, we raised uh, you know like questions to the government that why they didn't uh uh announce you know the how they are uh, uh collecting data and uh how they are collecting data of not just the covid positive patient but also like people around them so it was a little scary but um i think the the kind of um uh, steps that the government took and the, the app that they introduced i feel that it's also an attack on the right to privacy where the data protection uh, is actually not there at all and the respect to right to privacy especially by public bodies uh, um, it's not a norm um, so yeah i mean i think that's how we dealt with the lockdown but i mean now we we are again in the second wave so um, not sure like how um the respect to digital rights i don't see it during during lockdown but i saw that the government was very active 
in terms of blocking the apps it was wasn't just tiktok was black there was this gaming app uh, uh pubg uh, it is called pubg in pakistan so it was also banned during covid uh, and then all the online harms rules that i mentioned were also introduced in during the same lockdown so you see that the government was pretty active in you know enacting all these rules and introducing such things and banning apps and etc instead of addressing the issue of digital divide in the country karam how about our case your case <laughs> Uh, I'll start with my case. Uh, the good thing is I'm traveling, traveling less. This is a good part of it. Uh, uh, but the, the bad part of it is that uh, my dishwasher is working twice a day. Uh, I have two kids at home and uh, we keep cooking and eating at home. Uh, this, this is tiring for everyone, I guess. Uh, plus this uh, sitting and talking next to, to, to a a uh, computer is a tiring thing. We, we do it for meetings, with, for conferences, and, it's, and I feel really tired uh, at the end of the day. Uh, uh, I couldn't uh, uh, get used to this. Um, when, when we come uh, to the human rights issues, I, I want to touch, uh, I, I share uh, what I already said by Mick, that so uh, I will uh, look at, less digital issues on human rights in Turkey, how they have been affected from Corona. First of all, uh, the governments, uh, even before uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, the government was arbitrarily restrict restricting freedom of expression and other uh, basic rights. However, uh, using non-legal legal methods uh, has become a rule. Uh, during pandemic. What I mean by that, uh, rather than relying on uh, acts of parliament, uh, the government started to use uh, circulars uh, stated by Ministry of Interior. And uh, as you know, just uh, before midnight, uh, two hours before mi midnight, uh, Ministry of Interior announced that uh, there will be a curfew for two days. Uh, and he did it with, with a circular without any uh, legal basis for this. So uh, all state authorities uh, get used to use this method, using circulars, uh, some regulations instead of act of parliament to restrict freedom of uh, expression and other uh, rights. And I am afraid even after pandemic, uh, this might uh, stay as a common practice for administration uh, because nobody can question this new methodology because they say, okay, to save our health, uh, we should uh, excuse this arbitrariness, vagueness in the implementation of the law. This is the first thing. Secondly, uh, the government used pandemic uh, as a uh, chance to uh, impose more, more restriction on uh, opposition and minority groups. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, new investigations, prosecutions against uh, the uh, opposition, mainly pro Kurdish groups uh, and mayors, uh, as you know. But also, the government used this uh, uh, as an opportunity to pass some uh, uh, controversial. Um, acts from the parliament. One of them is uh, attorneyship law. Uh, uh, there, is, there was no debate in society about uh, the need of uh, lawyers uh, for such a uh, amendment. And there was no real discussion at the parliament uh, about uh, the necessity of the uh, amendment. But the government uh, quickly passed this from the parliament because the uh, agenda of uh, the people uh, has changed after uh, the disease, uh, so it's easier to uh, do it, uh, do, do things quickly at the uh, parliament. And uh, finally, uh, about the positive duties of the government, 
uh, we don't know uh, as uh, in Pakistan we don't know how many people how many students uh, do have really uh, access to this uh, online uh, education system uh, and what are the impacts of this uh, new uh, method of uh, education uh, on uh, students uh, we don't know uh, how it's going on uh, uh, national education system we don't know how uh, would be the effect on uh, university and academia. Uh, there is no transparency uh, about the results. So I think uh, this this will create uh, more division and inequality in the society in the long run because we don't know how long the uh, pandemic uh, will continue and how long students will have to stay uh, at home. And Turkish government's strategy has been to keep students uh, at home while uh, opening malls uh, and that's why we don't know whether this will change uh, in the coming months uh, because uh, as you know the winter is coming and uh, even uh, the experts working for the government have concerns uh, uh, about the uh, increase of the uh, pandemic uh, during uh, winter time uh, so uh, I think uh, this will cause more inequality uh, problems uh, in between uh, social groups, uh, minorities, ethnic groups and others. Uh, so without a strategy uh, to tackle with this problem, uh, I think uh, it's quite difficult to assess the real impact of uh, the disease um, in Turkey. Thank you. Uh, we, come, uh, we have come to the end of our time. Uh, thank you so much for your contributions. But I'll have last words from you, last but not least, of course. Uh, because as activists such as yourself, uh, the ones in the audience as well, uh, I'm sure we have very valuable, prominent guests uh, as our audience. So uh, please give us a message of hope or but maybe let's not get so <laughs> cheesy and talk about hope uh, but really being also objective uh, not just uh, trying to be optimistic uh, how, how how do you think uh, we can utilize the uh, arena of dig digital rights what hope you see for the future and also uh, in a, we, we, we all try to tackle very difficult questions uh, very dire abuses of rights so uh, in our panel so please uh, give us per perhaps as good examples or, uh, or as a message of for the future just uh, give us uh, your final thoughts um, shall i start to start <laughs> why not <laughs> uh, all right okay uh, uh, one of these digital conferences, a young human rights defender asked me, um, what should I do as a human rights defender? I told him that, uh, that he should be patient. Uh, I think the first thing that we need to be is uh, being patient uh, because uh, in the world that we live, uh, we shouldn't wait quick results uh, in our struggle. That, that's the first thing. Secondly, I think we shouldn't be consequentialists. Uh, in most of the uh, cases that we fight for, there will be no positive consequence, uh, but we, we will be still doing the good thing. So I think uh, even if I'm not optimist, I still believe that there are a lot of things to do uh, and the good intent is, is the thing the reason to do that, not the consequence. Uh, one day we might get some uh, result from what we do. Uh, several times we had, uh, but it didn't improve the uh, situation. Uh, uh, as you uh, mentioned, Susan, at the beginning in Twitter, YouTube cases, we won, but uh, things are not better than uh, at the days when they were blocked. Uh, but uh, uh, w w what I think is that we did the right thing and uh, it's best way to do the right thing again and again even when you lose it so uh digital 
rights perspective, um, it still this is the place where we can feel the freedom uh, the most comparing to the other fields. Uh, that's why uh, the life is uh, transferred to the digital life. Uh, it, it was already like this, but due to pandemic, this uh, transfer uh, was accelerated. And I think uh, we will have uh, options and opportunities uh, in the digital life to uh, share our views, to uh, organize, to, to work together, uh, to strengthen uh, human rights uh, struggle. This is my message. Thank you, Karim. And uh, the, people like you really make a difference because we're still speaking and uh, our uh, this uh, current panel has been broadcast on YouTube, so <laughs> we can be using them. So uh, people like you make uh, and Niktat make big changes, actually. So uh, Niktat, on to you. I'll echo what uh, Karim has said. Uh, it's not a struggle of one day or do not expect that the change will happen over the night. Uh, we one has to be patient. Uh, I uh, was very, I was just when I started working on digital rights, people used to say, even the human rights activists used to tell me what I'm about, you know, we are still struggling for human rights, human rights in the offline spaces. And you are talking about some like alien thing, digital rights. And, uh, and I just like stayed, uh, like stayed true to my mission. And, and now I can see that it's not just one person, but then there are many people who are talking about digital rights and it's their mission to, you know, make online spaces safer and open uh, for uh, everyone, for all. Um, but at the same time, I think I'm um, I'm happy to see, you know, like even if even after so many so so much restrictions and shutdowns, and people still raise their voice online, even after you know, like people, women who have spoken up for you know under me too they are facing defamation suits the cyber criminal charges uh, uh the cyber criminal defamation still younger women are speaking up against their perpetrators and around sexual harassment uh, there are still, still people who uh, uh, are raising a lot of issues they are gathering online so you, you know actually using their right to association and assembly and just yesterday um in a high profile case in in the supreme court uh two judges sh uh, issued their dissenting note and in one of the dissenting note is mostly talking about you know surveillance and right to privacy and this is for the very first time that any superior court talks about the right to privacy and against uh, mass surveillance of uh, uh, different powerful actors um, in, at such a length. So for me, these small little successes is uh, are actually, you know, our hope. And, uh, and I think we need to keep fighting for our spaces, whether they are offline or online. Um, losing hope is not an option for us at all. So just wanted to end here. Uh, thank you all, and thank you to the to Truth Memory Justice Center uh, for providing the, us this platform for this panel. Uh, it was, a, I, uh, in my view, uh, a really timely discussion uh, regarding digital rights, as we are all going digital these days. And uh, I want to thank all the uh, participants uh, for being with us this afternoon. Uh, also, Kerem Çiftçioğlu and Burcu Bingöllü behind the scenes. Thank you. Thank you very much.